Uh, thank you for that, Shish. Really interesting as ever. Um, my disclaimers for, uh, for this talk as well. Now, what Ashish has just shown us is that the association with hypotension and harm. There is a strong association with intraoperative hypertension and poor patient outcomes. There is a strong association with postoperative hypertension and poor patient outcomes, even if you don't have intraoperative hypertension. Now, the sheer volume of hypotension that we see in day-to-day -day practice, about one-third of patients have levels of hypotension in the period period that lead to harm. Multiply that by the number of surgeries we do, that's more people than who smoke. That is a huge potential public health problem that we have because of this simple hypertension. Now, as you just alluded to, some of the reasons why patients are hypertensive, and one of them is we don't measure it very well. The oscillometric thermometer, do you know when that was invented? 1871. It was automated in 1971. That's before I was born. We are using 50-year-old technology on a day-to-day -day basis. We can do much better. However, a fundamental problem for me about hypertension is that we treat it. We allow it to happen. We live in this very reactive state of medicine. Hypertension occurs, we get the purple drug, we give an injection, and we treat it. But in the interim, it's happened. And remember, the association of hypertension and harm is the cumulative amount of hypertension we have. So repeated small episodes over time lead to thresholds that cause poor patient outcomes. Now, hypertension doesn't just occur. Okay? It doesn't suddenly just happen like that, with the exception of a, a surgical clamp comes off. There is a state of biological instability that precedes it, okay, that leads to hypertension. Now, if we could detect this, and we can't with our current monitors, we can move to the state of proactive medicine, treating the event before it actually happens, or treating the physiology, rather, that leads to the event. And there are many futures on the horizon, non-invasive monitoring, continuous ward-based monitoring, but one future that is, well, it's not a future, it's here and it's now, is predicting hypertension before it actually occurs. And the algorithm comes from the Acuin Hypertension Prediction Index. Why use an arterial waveform to predict hypertension? Well, there's a very obvious, it measures your blood pressure. But it is a really rich source of data. Each individual arterial waveform gives us a huge amount of information. We can look at systolic rise time to look at contractility. We can look at systolic decay time to tell us about large vessel compliance. We can measure heart rate. We can infer stroke volume. Overall, from each individual waveform, you can extract around about 160 different features or physiological features. Now, this information on its own tells you very little about hypotension in the future, but how these things interact do. If we look at the variability of biological signals, that tells us a huge amount of information. As I stand here now, my pulse is about 70 or so. I'm not particularly fit. It's not really 70, is it, though? It's 68, and then it's 72, and then it's 70. The average is 70 over a minute or so. Now, this biological variability that we see, as we become unwell, we lose it, and we can quantify that. We can look at the complexity of the arterial waveform. That gives us huge information about instability. We've all seen this. We look at a nice, healthy patient, a very good arterial waveform. We can see the notch. We look at a septic patient on ICU. The waveform is almost featureless. And we can quantify that through a process called entropy. And we can look at how all these different factors interact with each other. And that starts to give us really, really big amounts of data, around about 3,000 features for each arterial waveform. And this is where machine learning comes in. And the biggest shock to me was when I thought machine learning, I thought you know, Terminator, artificial intelligence, it's just stats, but on a very, very large scale. You take those 3,000 features and you do simple rock analysis. You come out with around about 60 or so that are predictive of hypertension. And then you start doing what's called combinatorial analysis. You take those features, three at a time, and you multiply them together at different powers, so maybe minus two to plus two. And that then starts to give you around about two and a half million features for each arterial waveform. That is now big data when you apply it to 150 million arterial waveforms that we have in the database, 400 trillion data points. And what you come out with after the machine learning process is 23 features to predict impending, hand impending hypotension. So what you get is an algorithm in the box. You get a number. That's it there, the hypertension prediction index. And we get other parameters that I'll talk about briefly, such as DPDT, a measure of contractility, an EA-DYNE, 
a rather complex parameter, but gives us really rich information about how to treat patients. This is not a mystery number from the box. This is the output of a very complex algorithm looking at trillions of data points and many thousands or millions of features from arterial waveform. But what then is HPI? What is the hypotension prediction index? It's a number that relates to the likelihood of trending towards a hypotensive event. Now, currently, the event is predefined. It's fixed, a map of less than 65 for one minute or more. But essentially, the higher the number, the higher the HPI, the more likely you are to be hypotensive in the future and the shorter the duration to hypotension occurring. The lower the HPI, the less likely you are to be hypotensive, and if it does occur, it's much, much further forward into the future. So this is just data to illustrate that. It comes from one of our validation studies. Let's take a HPI output of around about 20 or so. About a third of patients at some point will be hypotensive. On the face of it, it seems bad. But as they approach hypotension, the HPI, HPI output starts to increase. But the average time to hypertension there is around about eight or nine minutes. Let's look at HPI where it's higher, so 90 to 99. Almost all patients will be hypertensive moving forward, and the time to hypertension is shortened, around about two minutes or so. Why is that important? What is the whole point of this? Well, the whole point is that you can intervene before hypertension happens. This is from an open anterior resection. The red line is our mean arterial pressure. The black line is our um, HPI. Now, HPI alarms here around about 85. That's when it has a high positive predictive value. But at this threshold, we don't see hypertension for seven minutes later. The whole premise of this technology is you have an early warning of impending hypertension. And once you have that, you interrogate the physiology to find out what the cause is and treat it before it leads to hypotension. However, these things are only useful if they are better than what we currently measure. And we measure a lot of parameters in theater and in the ICU. Let's just focus on mean arterial pressure. If you look at changes in mean arterial pressure, five, 10, and 50 minutes before hypotension occurs, and it doesn't matter whether you choose 30 seconds or one minute or five minutes, they are just about as good as tossing a coin. Changes in mean arterial pressure away from the events do not predict impending hypotension. And it doesn't matter what you measure. You can measure stroke volume. You can measure heart rate, SVV. They do not predict hypotension with any accuracy. HPI, however, does. We look at the area under the curve. At five minutes, it's 0.92. 15 minutes away from hypotension, it's about 0.87. All predictive algorithms suffer from this. The further away you get from an event, the harder it is to predict, although these are excellent AUCs throughout. But it's no different to going outside now. It's nice and sunny. You know you don't need an umbrella. Tonight, will you need one? Probably not, but you're not quite as sure. And so as you get away from an event, it becomes quite hard to predict. But when you look at HPI, 5, 10, 15 minutes before the event, it predicts it much better than any other parameter. And that makes common sense. This is a complex algorithm that is looking at 23 features, each of which a combination from different features. It is data rich, much better than just looking at single parameters. But going slightly off track now, and it probably raises a few eyebrows from the Edwards folks, it's more than this. Trying to say that HPI is just an algorithm that predicts hypotension is far too simplistic. It is a measure of hemodynamic instability. It's trying to quantify instability within this biological system, which in most people will lead to hypotension, but not all. But it does this, and it changes before we see any change in the common things that we measure. I'll just show you a little bit of stuff that Monty Myth and I did from a, a porcine hemorrhage model. Uh, we have our advanced monitor there, our hemosphere, or the EB1000 as it was then. We have our basic monitoring. Ignore the bottom two things, I'll come to them later. If you look at that bag of blood, and we started hemorrhage the model where that gray arrow is on the hemosphere there. That's the start of hemorrhage. As soon as you start removing volume from the system, you start to cause instability. And the only thing that detects that is this complex algorithm, HPI. As soon as you bleed the model, it starts to go up. There is no change in our stroke volume, in our mean arterial pressure, in our heart rate. They all remain constant. Okay? This is 160 mils, around about a 3% hemorrhage. Remove more blood from the system, cause more instability. And the only thing that changes that reflects that instability is the change in HPI. Now it's up to around about 64. It's slowly increasing. The more blood you take out, the more instability you cause, the more that number increases. 
but no changes in our macro hemodynamics, no change in our heart rate, no change in our mean arterial pressure. It's not until we get to a 10% hemorrhage, so 500 mils, that we start to see subtle signs in terms of our macro hemodynamics. Our map's still fine, our stroke volume's pretty constant as well, but we're just seeing SVV budge up now. That's after half a litre of blood loss, and the only thing that has reflected the change in hemorrhage is HPI. However, am I just making a problem that doesn't exist? Okay. Is hypotension really a problem for us? All we need to do is induce anesthesia, start the vasopressor from the word go, and we avoid all hypotension. It's very simple. We can just avoid hypotension by running a vasopressor infusion. But is that the right thing to do? If I look at the slide here, I walked into an operating room, I saw this, I think, I think I'm pretty happy with that. We've got a good stroke volume, a good cardiac index, our MAP is almost 90. It looks like we've given some fluid. Our SVV's come down, our stroke volume's gone up. But actually, if I tell you, this is the same porcine model that has lost a liter of blood, and we've normalized it with a vasopressor infusion. We have given fluid, we've taken it from the wrong compartment and forced it into our central circulation. And does that matter? It does matter, because we're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Okay? We have given fluid, but we're squeezing it from the wrong place. A bit like a sheesh, this is microcirculation, but from the gut level at the small bowel. Now you can see there on that slide, moving away there nicely, that's a healthy microcirculation. Those thumb-like structures are the small bowel villi, and we have a constant flow there. That is very healthy. Here is that same small bowel in that 1,000 liter blood loss where our macro hemodynamics, our MAP, our stroke volume, have all been normalized by a vasopressor. Okay. That is a gut that is in trouble. And why is it in trouble? Well, because of how it's perfused. It has a central, um, a central arteriole with venules that come down the side, so it has a counter current mechanism. And so our normal PA2 at the tip of a gut villus is only round about 40 millimeters of mercury or thereabouts. If you reduce flow or you reduce perfusion to that, it becomes acutely hypoxic. And if you do EM studies on this in about two hours, you see those tips have exploded. You have a release of 5-HT and you've disrupted your enteric barrier. That is nausea and vomiting, it's post-op gut dysfunction, and it's probably systemic inflammatory response coming forward for you as well. Now, that liter is an extreme example. But this is the same microcirculation at just 300 mils of 5% hemorrhage. Now, if you ventilate someone, you make them roughly about 300 mils deplete. Okay, so this is very physiological. We do this day in, day out. But that microcirculation flow is abnormal. It's pulsatile at parts. There's area of stasis. This is going to be, once again, post-op nausea and vomiting. Your patient will not be dreaming the next day. They won't be drinking. They won't be eating. They won't be mobilizing. They'll feel nauseous, and they will feel sick. We have to understand the underlying physiology that is causing hypotension and treat it accordingly, not just the MAP per se with a vasopressor. And to do that, we have to use more advanced hemodynamic parameters to help us determine what the underlying cause of the instability is, and what, more importantly, may be the appropriate treatment. Adequate flow and adequate pressure, both in tandem, have to be maintained. And we don't necessarily measure the right things to help us do that in our day-to-day -day practice. We can't manage blood pressure with a CVP and arterial line, and nor should we, because we have to manage both flow and pressure in combination to maintain our tissue perfusion. That's ultimately what we're trying to do. It is not about pressure alone and nebulous number. It is about individualizing management to obtain optimal flow and optimal perfusion. Map in isolation is not enough. Okay? It is flow and pressure together. Now, our advanced monitors give us much more guidance above and beyond these pressure waveforms. But in itself, in its current format, it doesn't always give us the complete picture. And so we can turn to imaging techniques, such as echo, which is a very common in day state practice now, to get more information, but these are intermittent techniques. You know, you're echoed maybe, what, once, twice a day on the ICU, almost never in the operating room. But we can use techniques such as echo to calibrate surrogates of contractility, which we get from our advanced monitoring. What we need to do is to balance the circulation. It's not about running a vasopressor to make the numbers look good. We need to consider preload, but as a sheet shed, patients aren't always preload responsive. We need to consider afterload, 
but I'd suggest only in patients who you're sure are euvolemic, and at times we need to look at contractility. And contractility is frequently underutilized, and it's a very calm, common cause of hypotension, particularly at the induction period. You know, all our agents are myocardial depressants. Okay? When you look to the data post-induction, very commonly, uh, a decrease in contractility is what's led to hypotension. Now, true contractility we get from pressure volume loops. We can't do that in theater or in ICU. So we look for surrogates, things to help us understand contractility. And the systolic rise time from the arterial waveform is one of those, so DPDT, change in pressure over change in time from the arterial waveform. It's a surrogate for LV contractility. To think what happens here in the heart is the same as what happens here in the wrist, well, clearly, they're not the same things. One happens with a closed aortic valve, one happens with an open valve, miles and miles away. And they're not the same. This peripheral measure underestimates true contractility, but they change or they trend in the same direction. And importantly, they trend with interventions. Give inotropes, um, give a vasopressor, give fluid, they trend together. And that's where it becomes useful. It correlates with what we see clinically. So this is an intracardiac echo, um, so a short axis view of the left ventricle, taken from intracardiac, so the tip's somewhere near the base from the right outflow. Now, on the advanced monitoring screen, what we've done with that uh, gray arrow is, is give a bolus of esmolol. And we see that measure of contractility, so DPDT, has decreased from around about the mid-300s to around about 150. It's approximately halved. If we look to our echo, it reflects what we see in this monitoring. Now in our echo, we've got reduced um, uh, to do fractional shortening, we have a larger end stock volume, and we have a reduced stroke volume or ejection fraction. There are limitations to DPDT. It is measured from peripheral artery. It's only been studied in limited patient populations. It underestimates true contractility, but it trends in the same direction as I've showed you just before. It reflects what we see clinically. There are no normal values. You, know, you can't say that yours should be 400 or somebody else's should be 600. Again, it's something we use as a trend. But caution just needs to be used in those with severe aortic stenosis and also vasoplegia or severe vasoplegia as well. It's not only changes in contractility we don't use very effectively to treat the appropriate cause of hypertension. We often perform interventions without knowing if they're going to have the desired effect that we want but you don't measure the correct parameters once again. Let's take a patient here who's hypotensive. We know they're in a preload dependent state because SVV is raised or PPV is raised. We give them fluid, that fluid will increase their stroke volume, but what does that do on blood pressure? We have absolutely no idea. We just give fluid with having no idea what that outcome is going to be or if it has the outcome that we want it to have. And that's because whether an increase in stroke volume translates to an increase in blood pressure depends on something called elastance. Now, elastance essentially is the reciprocal of compliance. The easiest way to think of it is take a brand new balloon, the first time you blow it up, it's really hard, you let it go, it's at the back of that room there. That is a highly elastic state. It wants to contract to where it became from. If you blow that balloon up 50 times, the next time that you blow it up, it's really easy. You let go and it just flitters down. That is a low elastic state. And why is that important? Well, when our ventricle becomes coupled to our aorta, it sees three things. It sees the inertial mass of blood, it sees the pressurization of the previous beat, and it sees this elastance. And that elastance is really important because if you can increase your stroke volume and that sees a highly elastic state in the aorta, you generate pressure. If it sees a low elastic state, that stroke volume gets absorbed by that low elastance. So it tells us a priori, or tells us whether we'll increase our blood pressure to increasing our stroke volume. Now, once again, we can't measure this very easily, but again, there are surrogates for it, and there's a concept of dynamic arterial elastance, EA dyne. Very simply, your pulse pressure variation divided by your stroke volume variation. So it's pressure over volume. Essentially, that is elastance. Why is that important? Well, let's look at a pressure volume curve for a, a given vessel at a fixed resistance. If we have a volume change, and that's the, all the SVV is, a change in volume over a respiratory cycle, if that doesn't generate much pressure change, then the ratio of EA dyne is low. So PPV over SVV, 10 over 15, 0.67. So when your EA dyne is low, if you give fluid 
in this individual, you will increase stroke volume, they are preload responsive. But that stroke volume will not generate pressure because on, your, on the low elastic part of the curve or the highly compliant part, however you want to think about it. The same change in volume, but this time on the hard elastic part of the curve, it generates pressure. So this time, eodyne is high. The ratio is 25 over 15, 1.67. So in this individual, if you give them fluid, they are preload responsive, they will generate stroke volume or an increase in stroke volume, and that will generate pressure. So eodyne tells us a priori whether giving fluid or not in preload responsive individuals will change our pressure or not. So if your blood pressure is low and you're preload responsive, eodyne will tell you whether fluid is the fix or not. There's also some use in terms of ICU as well, come from um, Pierre Guino's group uh, out of France looking at cardiac patients. And they found in a validation study that if eodyne was low, it told you that if you turned down your vasopressors, would your blood pressure or not decrease? If eodyne was less than one, you dropped your vasopressor, your blood pressure tended to drop. And he went on to use this in cardiac ICU to reduce the amount of pressor exposure that patients faced. And he reduced length of stay by around about a day or so as well. So eodyne essentially tells us it's the interaction of large vessel elastins and our ventricular contractility or elastins. It tells us who is preload dependent, whether they will increase their blood pressure or not to a fluid challenge. And the optimal cutoff is round about one, but there is a bit of a gray zone. And we can use it to titrate our vasopressor therapy as well. Why does it do this? It's very complex, we're not sure. It's probably a measure of ventricular arterial coupling. Essentially, it's telling us whether the heart can increase its stroke work. So if you drop your vasopressors, you decrease afterload, the cardiac system can increase stroke work and maintain blood pressure. If you give fluid, the heart can increase its stroke work, stroke work and hence generate pressure. And if we use this new technology, HPI and these advanced parameters, we can have a significant impact on post-op and intra-op hypertension. This is from the Amsterdam group, so Denise Filo and her team out of uh, Amsterdam, as I say. Major non-cardiac surgery, a 75% reduction in hypotension compared to the standard care. And their standard care group was goal-directed fluid therapy. Okay, their standard care baseline was pretty high as it started. Emanuel Schneck's group out of Germany, this time looking at orthopedic patients, we see 88% of the control group had hypotension, but under half of the HPI group suffered hypertension, and they decreased the total duration to almost nothing. But you will be familiar with this study from the Cleveland Clinic that used HPI but didn't reduce hypotension load in patients. And that's for a number of reasons. First of all, the hypertensive load was very, very low, less than half of expected. But I'll show you shortly that even with very low hypertensive levels in your institution, you can still reduce them um, further. But the reason that this trial didn't show a difference is that over half the time, there was no intervention to HPI alarming. If you've got a smoke alarm and you ignore it, you wake up in a house full of smoke. Okay? It's not rocket science. If you don't act on it, nothing changes. But when you do act on it, we see the same sort of reduction in hypertension, around about 57%. Now, this is some work we've done in York with, uh, with Groningen as well, with Thomas Shireen. Now, this is the same low baseline level of hypertension that you see in the Cleveland Clinic. So a time-weighted average of around about 0.15. Major non-cardiac surgery, this is our baseline data, okay? About 4% of time in hypotension. If you then tell people just to keep the map above 65, nothing changes. We're all trying to keep the blood pressure fine. We're all trying to keep it above 65. We come from a, a center that knows that hypertension is harmful. So just telling people to keep it above 65 makes no difference. But if you use advanced algorithms like this, like HPI, you can reduce hypotension to almost nothing, 0.9% of surgical time in hypotension using these advanced algorithms. If the fire alarm goes off and you respond to it, you find yourself outside in nice clear air. If you act on the algorithms or act on the alarms, then you can reduce hypotension. And that's because there was 80% compliance with this protocol. Use it, use it well, you could reduce hypertension. And real world data once again, this is from the US this time, the MPOG study, 11 US hospitals, and if you use it in real world, you reduce hypertension by, again, almost 60%. Very, very consistent message. The tools are there, we just have to engage with them and learn to use them properly. So I hope what I've told you over the last sort of 20 minutes or so 
Um, HPI is a machine learning algorithm. It predicts hypotension before it happens. It's representative more of instability, though. Don't just think of it as being hypotension. Think of it as reflecting instability in the cardiovascular system. Just running a vasopressor is not the solution. I think I've shown you that. I think Ashish has shown that as well. And what we need is an individualized strategy based on the true underlying physiology. And to do that, we need much more monitoring apart from just a CVP and an art line. And if we treat hypertension or we treat instability proactively using these advanced parameters, using HPI, we can reduce hypertension significantly in our day-to-day -day practice. That's got to be good for patients. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.